Hello, this is Faith at Faith in Books. I am going to do my December poetry reading. Um, I had decided that I, each month I would feature a different poet, um, both ones that I already knew about and poetry. I'm not that, I don't know much about poetry, um, and poets that I discovered or wanted to learn more about. This particular poet, though, I did know about. This is Jacoponi da Todi. There he is, and he is a, he was a Franciscan friar. Um, he lived, let me read the back of the book here. It says, Jacoponi de Todi, circa 1230 to 1306 in Italy, Toda, or Todi is the city that he came from, entered the order of friars minor during the last quarter of the 13th century when the conflict between the Franciscan conventuals and spirituals was raging. So, um, St. Francis of Assisi had this very extreme, austere um, way of life um, that he embraced lady poverty. So literally they had nothing but, you know, the one robe on their back and they would go around begging for food and finding shelter wherever they could. And a lot of people thought it was too extreme and that people could still have a calling to that, uh, to a Franciscan spirituality without having to go to quite that extreme. During his life, he held it together. There was tension even then. But after he died, it really, it turned into this bizarre feud between the two, um, the two factions. Anyway, um, so to continue on with the back of this, it says, uh, Jacoponi de Todi's lauds, which long have been an established place, have had an established place in the history of Italian poetry, sing the praises of poverty, insist on the supremacy of the love of God above all other loves, and inveigh against the worldliness of the church under the reign of Pope Boniface VIII. So, um, Jacoponi da Todi uh, is um, he came down on the side of the spirituals, of the more extreme, austere rule of life. Um, and, uh, well, let me explain about his life. So he was a young nobleman who studied law, and he got married. And apparently, this is the story, um, that his wife was more devout than he was. And one day he insisted that she go see some game or something at the at the stadium in, in Todi. And, um, and she went and the stadium collapsed on her and she was crushed and she died. When he heard of the accident, he ran to her and discovered that she had been wearing a hair shirt. And he knew that it was because uh, she was making that sacrifice for him and penance for him. So that really devastated him. And he sort of went crazy and he renounced everything and he lived as this homeless, kind of a holy fool um, in the town for about 10 years. And then after 10 years, he, he uh, joined the um, Franciscans. Uh, and he, um, he was known for his, the poetry he wrote. He was very hot-headed and he was very, um, he, he very much got involved in the feud that was going on between the spirituals and the conventuals. And Pope Boniface VIII sided with the conventionals, and he, um, uh, Jacoponi de Todi, couldn't keep his mouth shut. And uh, Pope Boniface, I mean, this was back, they didn't have a separation between church and state. Uh, he, uh, Pope Boniface wound up, wound up throwing Jacoponi into prison, and he was actually in prison, I think, for three years. Uh, he, he was excommunicated. And then he finally got out, and I think his health was pretty broken after that, and he um, he wound up dying, you know, a couple of years later. Anyway, so he wrote lots of beautiful poetry, um, but I'm just going to read this one poem. It's a little bit long. Let me take a sip of water here. Um, but this is his third letter from jail to Pope Boniface VIII. Um, and I, I mean, I like to read this because it makes me realize that the church has been, it's always been fighting corruption and, 
and uh, evil in its ranks. Um, and so it kind of gives me hope that it will continue on in spite of everything that's wrong with it. Um, and this, <laughs> Jacoponi de Todi just, it, I mean, he is an angry Franciscan. And he writes this to Pope Boniface VIII. All right, here's the poem. Pope Boniface, if you, you've had a good deal of fun in this world, you'll not be very lighthearted, I suspect, when you leave it. The world does not usually let its servants take their leave joyfully. No special privilege will exempt you from this rule, allow you to turn down the gift you have coming. You had your fill. I thought at one point of the world and its dealings, but once you found yourself on the papal throne, those past ambitions seemed modest indeed. Ingrained habit becomes second nature. You were always intent on accumulating riches, but now you find licit gains are not enough. You've taken to stealing like a vicious highwayman. Body and soul sweeping aside all sense of shame, you've given yourself to advancing your family's fortunes. You have built your house upon sand, and there's never any future in that. Just as fire renews the salamander, so scandals give you new life confidence and boldness. The care of souls doesn't seem to interest you much. When you die, you'll see the abode you've prepared for yourself. Should a bishop of no account have a bit of money laid aside, you know how to deal with him. You send him to the papal chamberlain. There are hints at the possibility of removal from office. If he comes across with a contribution, he'll find he can live in peace again. Should a castle in the country strike your fancy, You drive a wedge between the brothers who own it. To one, an embrace. To the other, the flash of a dagger. And you threaten to use it when you meet with resistance. You think with craftiness you will rule the world. What you build one year crumbles the next. The world is not a horse you can bridle to be mounted and ridden at your pleasure. The day you said your first mass, darkness fell over the land. Such a storm came up, not one candle was left burning. There in the church where you stood at the altar. On the day of your enthronement, there was no want of witnesses. Forty men were killed as they were leaving the palace. A clear sign of God's displeasure. Of all men living, you consider yourself the most worthy to sit on the papal throne. You call on St. Peter to speak in your favor, to confirm that you know more than he ever did. You placed yourself on a level with God and challenged his sovereignty. As with Lucifer, ruin followed immediately. A prisoner in your own house, no one can help you. Behold a new Lucifer on the papal throne, poisoning the world with his blasphemies. Nothing good is left in you, only sin. I'd be ashamed to mention some vices you're accused of. Blaspheming for no good reason, you condemn religious orders. God will let you perish in this turbulence, and all men's tongues will curse your name. Your tongue is murderous in its arrogance, heaping injury and humiliation on all. Not even an emperor or a king can leave your presence without suffering and affront. O vile greed, thirst that grows and grows, with all you drink you are never sated. Have you ever thought, you wretch, that those for whom you steal have stolen from you something you were not aware of? In a holy week, when people stay at home in mourning, your servants were going around Rome jousting, breaking lances, singing and dancing. God will punish you severely for this. In the heart of St. Peter's, near the Holy of Holies, you sent your servants to dance and sing. The pilgrim, scandalized, cursed you and cursed your gold and your shining nights. You thought that magic could lengthen your life, but you cannot know the day or the hour. In sin, life often comes to such a sudden end, and death looms abruptly in moments of joy. I can find no one who can remember any pope of the past who was so vainglorious. To have cast aside as you have the fear of God is a sign of either heresy or despair. So he was pretty angry. He wrote other, um, you know, much more spiritual uh, poems, but I guess that's enough for now. Anyway, he amuses me. I find him very interesting, and uh, every once in a while I pick up this book and thumb through it and read some of these uh, 
poems he's, he's written. Anyway, that's today's installment. Bye.